Thank you. Well, a very happy Easter to you. It's great to see you. As we come to worship God, his word says, but thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Well, let's stand and sing our opening hymn, an old classic, an old Easter hymn, hymn number 281, 281, thine be the glory, risen, conquering, son, endless is the victory, thou or death. There's one, 281. Never to die again. 
We thank you that endless is the victory that your Son, the Lord Jesus, has won for us. How we thank you, O oh Lord, that he came back even to defy death, even to come back from being fully dead and now fully bodily alive again. We thank you, O oh Lord, for that great truth that he is risen. And we thank you that he is risen indeed. That great Saviour, the Lord Jesus, and is alive today and welcomes those who simply come to him by faith and who trust in him and who venture everything of themselves on Christ. Lord, we pray for this service that we would remember the risen Lord that we would lift up Jesus Christ in our hymns that reflect this great truth that is so central to the Christian faith, the resurrection of Jesus. We ask that we would sing heartily to your praise and glory, and we would truly mean what we sing, that we would be in that living relationship with Christ himself, having him living inside of us. And we pray for the reading of your word, the Bible. And we pray for a message centered around some of these themes this morning. We ask that you would speak to our hearts. We pray that you would do us good. We ask that every one of us would be trusting in Jesus Christ. We do indeed give him the glory, risen, conquering son, the one who conquered we pray, O oh Lord, that he would have all of the glory. May we truly say that no more we doubt your son. May we trust in him and say, even as that person said to Jesus, long ago, Lord, I believe, help my unbelief. We ask that we would venture on Christ. So be with us throughout our time together. And may the Lord Jesus be praised. Because we ask it in his worthy name. Amen. Well, let us open our Bibles and we turn to the Gospel of John. The Gospel of John, chapter 11. John, chapter 11. And we'll read the opening 27 verses. John, chapter 11. Reading from verse 1 to the end of verse 27. It's on page 951. If you have a church Bible in front of you. John, chapter 11. Reading from verse 1 to the end of verse 27. Page 951. Let's hear God's word. Now a certain man was sick, Lazarus of Bethany, the town of Mary and her sister Martha. It was that Mary who anointed the Lord with fragrant oil and wiped his feet with her hair, whose brother Lazarus was sick. Therefore the sisters sent to him, saying, Lord, behold, he whom you love is sick. When Jesus heard it, he said, This sickness is not unto death, but for the glory of God, that the Son of God may be glorified through it. Now Jesus loved Martha, and her sister, and Lazarus. So when he heard that he was sick, he stayed two more days in the place where he was. Then after this, he said to the disciples, let us go to Judea again. The disciples said to him, Rabbi, lately the Jews sought to stone you, and are you going there again? Jesus answered, are there not twelve hours in the day? If anyone walks in the day, he does not stumble, because he sees the light of this world. But if one walks in the night, he stumbles, because the light is not in him. These things he said, and after that he said to them, Our friend Lazarus sleeps, but I go that I may wake him up. Then his disciples said, Lord, if he sleeps, he will get well. However, Jesus spoke of his death. But they thought that he was speaking about taking rest in sleep. Then Jesus said to them plainly, Lazarus is dead. And I am glad for your sakes that I was not there. That you may believe. Nevertheless, let us go. 
Gate. Then Thomas, who is called the twin, said to his fellow disciples, Let us also go, that we may die with him. So when Jesus came, he found that he had already been in the tomb four days. Now Bethany was near Jerusalem, about two miles away. And many of the Jews had joined the women around Martha and Mary to comfort them concerning their brother. Now Martha, as soon as she heard that Jesus was coming, went and met him. But Mary was sitting in the house. Now Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But even now I know that whatever you ask of God, God will give you. Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. Martha said to him, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection at the last day. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he may die, he shall live. And whoever lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? She said to him, Yes, Lord, I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of God, who is to come into the world. Let's sing our second hymn, number 284, in our hymn books, the final triumph won, the full atonement man, <coughs> salvation's work is done, and redemption's price is paid. Number 284. <laughs> Easter, 
to win this. Any guesses? Turkey. Turkey? That's not one thing. Do you have turkey at Easter as well as Christmas? Is that right? Not this one. Not this one. Oh, okay. Now I'm thinking about something else that's sweet, it's not savoury. Any guesses? How about the adults? Hot cross buns. Hot cross buns. Yeah. There you go. There's even a rhyme, isn't there, about hot cross buns. You ever learned the rhyme about hot cross buns? I'm still trying to work out what the significance of that rhyme is, aren't you? One a penny, two a penny, hot cross buns. If you have no daughter, so give them to your sons. One a penny, two a penny, hot cross buns. Hot cross buns. Well, they're very popular at this time of year, particularly at Easter, because of the cross that's on it to remind us about the Lord Jesus Christ and the cross. Very popular this time of year. And apparently that's the origins of where they came from. And that's why we have them at Easter to remember the cross. What Jesus did on Good Friday when he died on the cross for our sins. The Bible says this. Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. And what that means in the Old Testament all the way there, bit by bit, they pointed forward to Jesus Christ coming into the world and dying for our sins so that all the wrong things that we've done and thought can be forgiven. So you remember, if you have our cross buns, the cross that the Lord Jesus died on for our sins. Christ died for our sins. Well, let's pray again. We're going to pray for our world in which we live, the situation again in Ukraine doesn't go away, does it? So we're going to pray for that and other needs. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you and we praise you for your mercies, O oh God, toward us. We thank you for every remembrance of the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ. We thank you that on that first Good Friday, the Lord Jesus Christ laid down his life for our wrong. We thank you that he died for the thing you call sin, that lawlessness that is against you. We thank you that there is an answer for that enmity, for that distress that's between us and you, that controversy that we have between you and, and us as you are maker. And we pray that you would help us to see our need of Christ and to come running to him and we thank you that he rose again. We praise you for all the benefits you give to us, temporal and physical. We thank you, O oh Lord, for our world in which we live. But we know that it's a sad world. And we pray once again for the situation in Ukraine. We ask, O oh Lord, for those people who won't be enjoying Easter as they normally would. And have done for many years because of the conflict. We pray naturally for peace to be restored. We ask that you would stop that hand of aggressors. And we thank you that the Lord Jesus is never violent. We thank you that he's peace loving. We thank you that he's the Prince of Peace. We thank you, Lord, that he told us to turn the other cheek and to pray for those who persecute us. And we thank you, Lord, for the peace that the Lord Jesus gives us. And we ask that there would be true peace, yes, that there would be a cessation of war, but more than that, that there would be this gospel peace that would be in the Lord Jesus Christ. We thank you for churches in Donbass and other places that are reaching out with the good news of the Lord Jesus. Father, we pray for those in our fellowship who are not well, that you would be near to them, those who would love to be here and normally would be on Easter Sunday especially, but are unable, we pray that you would do good to Christine. We pray that cast would come off on the 20th of April, that she'd be back with us. We pray for Margaret Burnhouse there in that hospice. Lord, please be near her and strengthen her. We ask in you, and no doubt we'll be thinking very much about the Lord Jesus Christ. And Father, for ourselves, as we in a few moments think through some of these implications of the Lord Jesus and what he did on that first Easter time. We ask, O oh Lord, that we would respond to you in your word and that we too will have faith in Jesus Christ because we pray in his name. Amen.
280 is our third hymn before the message, 280. The happy morn is come, triumphant o'er the grave, the Saviour leaves the tomb, omnipotent to save. 280. <laughs> Easter Sunday, 
Sunday. Who exactly is he? Was he just an ordinary person in history? Was he just an important figure? Or was he more? Who exactly is Christ? Such a vital question that we ask ourselves. Who is Christ? And then in the second place, we're going to ask this. What must we do? What must we do in the light of who Jesus Christ really is? Because Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. It's a nice statement, but we can't leave it there. How does that apply to your life and to mine at this Easter? And then lastly, what is the result? What is the result of doing what Jesus says we should do? And that is, even though we die, we'll live. Three questions then. First of all, who is Christ? Who exactly is it? He said, I am the resurrection and the life. Now, what's the context of this particular statement? Who does Jesus say this? Well, as we've said, he said it to Martha. But in what circumstances did he say this to Martha? Well, it was in the face of loss and of tragedy. There was a man called Lazarus, who was a friend of Jesus. And Lazarus, where did he come from? He came from a place called Bethany. Where's Bethany? Well, we're told that it's two miles away from Jerusalem, the very epicenter of Jewish activity. Bethany. And Lazarus is sick, he's ill, and he's near death. And he has two sisters, one of them is called Mary, and the other one is called Martha, and they manage to send a note to Jesus to explain this situation of the dire circumstances of Lazarus. Jesus is not in Bethany at the time, he's somewhere else, but they manage to get this message to Jesus to explain the situation. And it's very effective, isn't it? The way it's put across in verse 4, we see this. When, or verse 3. Therefore the sisters sent to him, that's Jesus, saying, Lord, behold, that means look, see, he whom you love is sick. Because they knew, the sisters, that Jesus loved Lazarus. And we're actually told, if John puts this note in here, verse 5, now Jesus loved Martha, and her sister, and Lazarus. The heart of the Lord Jesus Christ is incredible. He loved like nobody else loved. He loved incredibly. And he loved all sorts of people. And it was love that drew Jesus to go to the cross. It was his heart that caused him to go there on that first Easter and to rise again three days later. He's an incredible Jesus who loves. And he loved Lazarus. And he loved Martha. And he loved Mary. And he loves people. And that is why he came. Out of love for people like you and me. Even though we let God down. Even though we sinned against him. He loves us. And that's why he came. And died out of love. Later on in the scriptures it says. The son of God who loved me. And gave himself for me. It was out of love. But interestingly enough, as soon as Jesus received this message, we would have thought that would be it. He'd be on his way with his disciples going up to Bethany to see Lazarus, to heal him as he often did. He healed people. He had compassion. But he stays. And we think, well, I wonder what Jesus is doing. Do you ever read that, the life of Jesus, or hear about the events of his life and wonder, well, why exactly did he do that for? Why does he wait? Because he's going to do something even more spectacular, even more incredible than just heal Lazarus from his sickness. He's going to raise him from the dead. And so even when Lazarus sadly dies, he still delays his coming. Because he's going to make sure that Rigamont is really has set in and that he really is dead. The body is going to be stinking. So nobody can say, ah, but he wasn't really dead. He was put in the tomb before. There was no issue with this. Lazarus really, truly was dead. And Jesus is going to perform an incredible miracle. He's going to raise him from the dead. An incredible thing he's going to do. And that's what Jesus Christ does spiritually for people. People who are dead in trespasses and sins. Trespasses is another word for sins. He makes us alive again. Spiritual life in Jesus Christ. Christ. Well, eventually he comes to 
Bethany, and as soon as Martha hears that Jesus is in town, that's it, she runs to meet him. And she speaks to him. And during their conversation, she explains about how if he was, if you were here, he would have not have died. But even now I know that whatever you ask, God's going to do it for you. And Jesus explains about the resurrection, the future resurrection that Martha believed in of the body. And she said, I know that Lazarus is going to rise again. But Jesus, to take her thoughts away from just general thoughts, future resurrection somewhere, to specific thoughts, to raise her high, higher in her estimation about what that means, Jesus says, I am the resurrection and the life. In other words, it's bound up in me. Now what a statement. Because if anybody else made this statement, it would be wrong, wouldn't it? Sometimes we say, you know, that person, they strut around as if they're the big I am. Have you ever heard that one? Well, Jesus can truly, not in any arrogant way, he's not strutting around like a peacock, but he is simply saying who he is. Incredible claims, aren't they? I am the resurrection and the life. Now, in order for there to be a resurrection, there needs to be a death. And that's what happened on that first Good Friday. And he knows Jesus that soon after this event here, not many days after, Jesus is going to go to a cross and he's going to die. And it's so important that we understand that it's Good Friday because he died for our wrong, so that our wrong can be forgiven. That yes, in one sense it's a bad Friday. We don't glory in all the glory details, but we do glory in the fact of what Jesus did there when he died in our place. I was told recently, I, get, I, hope it, I think it's true, it's a reliable source, but that in Tokyo, in the 1990s, if you wanted as a foreigner to go and set up residency in Tokyo, you had to have what was called a substitute. So that means you couldn't just rock up and live there. You would have to have a, a, relative, a native of the land who would take your place if you broke the law. And people would hire themselves out to be a substitute so that if you broke the law as a foreigner going to be a citizen in that particular place, that native would bail you out. And that is exactly what the Lord Jesus Christ did on that first Good Friday. He died in our place. We've broken the law. Not the laws of the land, we may have done, but the laws of God. And we, every one of us is guilty, doesn't matter who we are, we're guilty before God, and we are when we consult our consciences, and we know deep down in our heart of hearts that what God says in his word is true, we're guilty. But Jesus has taken that punishment for us on Good Friday, so that when we trust in him, our sins are forgiven, and we have peace with God. That's the best news you'll ever hear. Peace with God for eternity. And then when we rise again on that final day, we can be in Christ. It's bound up in the Lord Jesus Christ. He is the resurrection. He's going to die and he's going to rise again, never to die again. The resurrection of Christ. He's the resurrection, not a resurrection. The definite article is there. He's the resurrection. He says, I am. That's very emphatic. Have you ever heard of the word ego? You might know that the New Testament was originally written in normal Greek. It was the normal trade language of the day. And some of our, some of our English words are taken from Greek, and one of them is ego. You know when you say to someone, they've got an ego, it's about them? Well, Jesus can truly say ego. The word is, is ego amy, which means I, I am. It's very emphatic. He says literally, I am the resurrection and the life. I truly am here. What a statement to make. And here John faithfully writes down what Jesus Christ said. He's the resurrection. And he is the life. Now I might not know all of you very well. But I do know one thing about you. You're searching for life. You want to live, don't you? What's life all about? Have you ever asked yourself that question? Here we are, we've been given life as a gift. However many years ago we were born into this world. What is it all about? I remember once a work 
colleague said, why don't we all get into a room and discuss the meaning of life? And what he meant by that is, it's a philosophical question. We have so many different opinions, it's such a, a vast subject. What is the meaning of life? Have you ever asked yourself that question? What is its purpose? Why am I actually here on this earth? We're searching for life. We want to live. What is the true meaning of it? What is life really all about? Well, we haven't got a guess. Life is about Jesus Christ. Because he said, I am the resurrection and the life. It's about me. He's the true life. Isn't it great this time of year when the daffodils come up? You know, they, they lie dormant for so long and they come up as new life. There's new life. And, and I'm told, I'm not much of a, a plant expert, but my wife is more. And she told me, that, so I'm good authority, okay, that there's a cluster. What happens is, is that over a period of time, when they come up over every year, there's more and more that come up as a cluster. And there's true life, new life. And Jesus Christ, offers new life to those who come to him. He said, I have come that you may have life and that you may have it more abundantly. One version puts to have it to the full. To have true, meaningful life in Jesus Christ. True life. Have you got that life? Because just as he is the resurrection, he is also the life. Just as resurrection is bound up in Jesus, so too is life bound up in Jesus Christ. So who is Jesus? He says, I am the resurrection and the life. Second question is this, what should we do? Now that should cause a response in it, shouldn't it? We shouldn't just say, well, that's all a very nice statement and it's all very nice on Easter Sunday to think about who Jesus actually is and that's just something that we can sort of think about, you know, and, and that's nice to know, isn't it? But actually, we've got to say, how does it affect me and you? What have we got to do in the light of it? Just imagine if you were on holiday and you went to a foreign country and when you were staying in a particular town, somebody told you, well, actually, today is a very special day. And you say, well, why? Because you see that man over there, well, he's actually the king of our country. Wow. You wouldn't be neutral, would you? You would have, it would have a response. That's the king. That's his position. Wow. And it is a, needs a response to think about who Jesus Christ is. When we think about the truth claims of Jesus, that he's not just a moral teacher, although he was, but actually he claims radical, incredible things that are actually life-changing, what we've got to do is ask that question, what is my reply? How should I respond to who Jesus Christ claims that he is? How should I do it? Well, he tells us. What does he say to Martha, which is so relevant for us? He said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. This is our response. He who believes in me. There should be belief. Now, what's belief? To believe is to trust. Is to have a persuasion. Is to have a conviction. Is to say, absolutely, I am trusting. Now, what do you believe in? Who do you believe in? You see, notice what Jesus says. He doesn't just say, he who believes. He doesn't stop there, does he? He says, he who believes in me. I'm the object of that belief. Years ago, somebody said to my old minister, they said, I'm a believer. So the old minister said, well, that's great. What is it that you believe? So they said, well, I don't know, I just believe. I'm like, what good's that? I mean, none of us come in here today. He said, oh yeah, as long as you go up, believe, it doesn't matter what it is, but as long as you believe, it doesn't matter what it is, but it's good you've got to believe. But what happens if that belief's wrong? Do you know there's something worse than no hope? There's something worse than no hope. Do you know what it is? False hope. And we need to make sure that what we're believing is right. And we've got to make sure that what we're believing holds up. Because the storms of life are going to come, and they are. How are we going to deal with it? How, what are we going to make of life? And, as we're going to see in a minute, what are we going to do with that final nemesis of death, which is coming?
coming toward us. Jesus said, he who believes in me. That's the object of our trust. He's Christ. We believe in Christ. We trust in him. That's what true Christians do. They take Jesus at his word and they trust him. And they believe in him. And their lives are radically changed as a result. We're followers of Jesus Christ. We're not weirdos being in from Mars. We're normal people. We have normal lives. But something extraordinary has happened to us. This person called Jesus has come into our lives and we believe in him and we trust in him. And as we live life, we've got no regrets about trusting. He never leads us up the garden path. He never pulls the wool over our eyes. We can trust Christ. And it's interesting that Jesus, throughout his ministry, <coughs> emphasised this belief. Right from the get-go, right from the outset of his ministry, in Mark chapter 1, it says, repent and believe the gospel. That's all we have to do. Repent means to turn around. It means to turn from our sin and to trust in Jesus Christ. So having heard who Jesus is, what you and I must do is believe the gospel. Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. He said it again in one of the most famous, if not the famous verses in the Bible. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, his special son, his unique son, his one and only son, his only begotten, that whoever believes in him, whoever trusts in him, whoever it is, whoever you are, we haven't got to pull up ourselves by our bootlaces to try and get better before we come to him. We come to him as we are and we trust in him and we believe in him and whoever believes in him has eternal life, Jesus said. He emphasised it again and again and again. And the chapter left after that, John chapter 4, there was Jesus and he went on a journey and he sat by a well and he's exhausted because he's man as well as God. And he said to a Samaritan, oh, big no-no this, Jews and Samaritans, they didn't have any dealings with each other. They didn't really speak to each other. But Jesus broke down cultural barriers, which is what he does, because the gospel is what's going to sort out racism, by the way. It's Jesus, and he said, give me a drink. And she thought, what are you doing asking me for a drink? And Jesus went on to talk about living waters. And whoever drinks of this well, they're going to thirst again. But whoever drinks of the water that I shall give, shall never thirst again. And this woman, wow, she was so amazed that she dropped her water bottle, a water pot, and she ran back into the village and she said, come see a man who told me all things that ever I did. Could this be the Christ? And we're told about how things turned out. And how things turned out was that people came to know and to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ for themselves. Verse 39 of John 4, and many of the Samaritans of the city believed in him because of the word of the woman who testified. He told me all that ever I did. So when the Samaritans had come to him, they urged him to stay with him. And he stayed there two days. And many more believed because of his own word. Then they said to the woman, now we believe. You see the emphasis of belief. Now we believe, not because of what you said, for we ourselves have heard it. And we know that this is indeed the Christ, the Saviour of the world. The emphasis, belief, belief, belief. Who can you believe? There's so many broken promises today. And if you trust in people, they let you down. But this man you can trust. This man you can believe in. He who believes in Oh, they you cling on of Jesus Christ. And not just Jesus Christ teaching, but those that came after him, the apostles, the disciples of the Lord Jesus, that were called apostles, which means sent one, they also talked about belief. We had Peter in a big defining moment when he spoke to a load of Gentiles, which means non-Jews, in a household called Cornelius. And he spoke once again about belief. That's how we applied it. What did he say? About believing in God. Acts chapter 10, verse 43. To him, all the prophets witness, that's all the prophets in the Old Testament, that through his name, whoever believes in him 
will receive remission or forgiveness of sins. It's belief in Christ. Do you believe him? Do you trust in him? Do you say, Lord, I'm going to give you my everything. And I'm going to depend only on you. I love giving this illustration. A number of years ago, we went to Ireland on holiday. I went to Karakarine. Have you ever been to Karakarine? Have you ever been over that road bridge at Karakarine? My son, who's sitting at the back, he ran across that road bridge and he ran back as if it was nothing. But when you go across and you look down and you see this big drop and there's this, this and it's, the wind is flapping around and, and you, oh dear, and you, and you, you, you know, your heart's in your stomach, isn't it? And you think, oh dear. And when you put your foot on that road bridge, you put all your weight on that road bridge, don't you? And Jesus is saying, that's how we've got to be with him. We've got to put all our weight on him. For now, for eternity, on him. Whoever believes in him. Have you ever heard of a lady called Catherine Van Bora? Have you ever heard of her? She's Martin Luther's wife. Not Martin Luther we're thinking about earlier. Martin Luther King. You know, the German reformer. And apparently on her deathbed she said this. I will stick to Christ as a bird to a top gun. Have you ever seen birds? Have you ever seen those plants and the, the, the little sticky things and then they have little hooks on the end and they're really annoying. Have you ever gone walking in the woods and, and, and it gets on your cut? It's so difficult to get off, isn't it? Have you ever had that experience? And those birds and they go sticking on you. That's how we've got to stick to Christ. That's what it means to believe in Him. Whoever believes in me. Who are you believing? Oh, Christ has proven again and again to be trustworthy. He really is. He stacks up. You can look at it academically. You can look at all the evidences. Here's eyewitness accounts of the life of Jesus and the death of Jesus and the resurrection of Jesus. And we've proven him to be time and again trustworthy in our lives. Oh, the and then you carry on believing in in Christ. And you do that now. Trust in him with this Easter Sunday. He's not far from you. Why not today? Of all days, to trust in Jesus Christ. So we've seen the first question, who is Christ? We've seen secondly, what you must do. Thirdly, what is the result? Okay, you say, right, I know who Jesus is. He's the resurrection and the life. Resurrection found up in him. He rose again from the dead. He, life is bound up in Christ. These are big claims. Okay. I need to believe in him. That's clear. What happens when I believe in him? What's the result? Well, Jesus tells us, doesn't he? He says, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, even though he dies, he shall die. Sorry to be morbid on Easter Sunday, but facts are facts, aren't they, friends? And the reality of death is true. And in the midst of life, there's death. And do you know why death is? It's horrible, by the way. It's not how God intended it. It's unnatural, and it's an intruder on our lives, isn't it? It's a real intruder. But it came about because of our first parents. And we believe in a literal Adam and a literal Eve. And they were in a literal garden called the Garden of Eden. And God was so kind to them and said, you can eat of any tree you want from the garden freely, as much as you like. But there's just one tree of what we call the knowledge of good and evil. And you can't eat from that tree. Because if you do, death is going to come into the world. Why are we in the mess we're in? We're in the mess we're in as a world because of this thing called sin. And everything else are symptoms of this big problem. It is true. And they rejected God's word. And ever since, mankind's rejected God's word. And there is now death. It's horrible. Because the Bible says that therefore, just as through one man, sin entered the world, and death through sin, and thus death spread to all men, because all have sinned. It's a sad reality of life that one day we're all going to face it. 
with, unless Christ comes again. But we've got to face this. One in one night. One day it will be you, and one day it will be me. And the big question we've got to ask is this. Are we ready? Are we ready? You know, Tuesday I've got to go to the Father in Lord's funeral. And I've got to stand, as, as I've done so many times before, and lead a funeral. A man of 67 died of a heart attack. He's gone. Early Sunday. A father. But he trusted in Jesus Christ. And his only hope to be right with God was on Jesus Christ. And he knows, he knew, that when he died, when that moment will come, he would be right with God and go to heaven when he dies. Because although death is a reality and we can't face it, we can't back under it, we can't get around it, we can't avoid it, when your number's up, it's up. When the sand runs out, it runs out. Friends, it really does. We don't know where it's going to be. It's an ever-present enemy. But does that mean to say we just ignore it? Does that mean to say we just don't engage with it? Well, we might not engage with it as much as you want, but friends, that's not going to help you, is it? It's not going to help you. Because there is an eternity beyond. And Jesus says, He who believes in me, though he may die, he shall live. And this is the wonder of Christianity. It gives us an answer for our final nemesis. What other thing can give you peace and joy on your death? than the hope claims of Jesus. That when you die, you're not done for. Your soul lives on, and we can live in heaven forever with Jesus. You see, death for the Christian is just a creaky door for heaven on the other side. That's what death is. It's just a river that we pass through to then go and be in eternal bliss forever with God. You see, we're just passing through this earth. There was a man who once went on a foreign holiday and he went to visit somebody while he was on holiday. And he noticed as he walked into the room that there wasn't many articles of furniture around, there were just a few little bits here and there. So he said to this person, well, where's all your furniture? The man said, well, where's yours? So he said, well, I'm just visiting. To which he replied, so am I. So friends, we're just visiting. We're just visiting this earth. There's an eternity to face. And we've got to face it, haven't we? With Christ, that risen Christ, we can face it with joy and with certainty and with peace and with comfort and to know that that is true life because even though he dies, he'll live. We know that death isn't the end. And for the Christian, it's a glorious reality for us. That whenever that moment will be, what a comfort it is to know we can be forever with Jesus Christ. What is life to you? For some people, if you just take out all the letters of life except for the second, that's what it is for some people. It's an eye. Is life just about our happiness? It's all about me. Me, myself, and I. Well, there's lots of people that have that philosophy of life. Maybe life for you is as if you take the first letter away and the last letter away and you have an if. Maybe it's just an if. You know, if only I do this, if only I have the promotion at work, if only I have that, if only I have this, life would be complete for me. It's just an if. For some people, if you have all the letters of life but you take away the F, what have you got? Some people, life is a lie. It's just trying to be someone that we're not. The true life, with all four letters, truly is found in Jesus. It's found in that wonderful Saviour who came for us. So that when we die, we don't have to dread that final nemesis because it will just be a way of transporting us into the presence of Jesus Christ forever. Oh, I hope that this is the time that you'll come to that one who claimed himself to be the resurrection and the life. That you'll think about that person who emerged from the tomb victorious and lives in the power of an endless life and come to realize that you are wrong before him 
and trust in him that he has taken the weight of your sin upon himself at the cross and risen again and offers new life to anyone who comes to him. Because Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he may die, he shall live. Well, let's stand and sing our final hymn, a great old classic Easter hymn, 267, Christ the Lord is risen today, hallelujah, sons of men and angels say, hallelujah, particularly verse 4, lives again our glorious King, where our death is now your sting, once he died our songs to sing, where's your victory, boasting God, 267.
sheep, through the blood of the everlasting covenant, make you complete in every good work to do his will, working in you what is well pleasing in his sight, through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory for ever and ever.